Neural networks are employed in different contexts and for different purposes. They can be used by computational neuroscientists who use networks as a tool for exploring the properties of biological neurons and their populations. They can also be employed by connectionist modelers whose goal is to develop computational models of psychological phenomena with less emphasis on the biological details. Finally, they might be used not in order to reflect or model actual psychological or neural system, but in order to implement efficient solutions to practical problems, such as stock market prediction, character recognition, image processing, etc. In fact, they are everywhere nowadays. In these videos, we won't focus on this third type of use, since we are interested in neural networks as models of actual cognition. As we said before, the architecture of connectionist networks is inspired by the brain. The basic processing unit in the brain is the neuron, and all the information processing in the brain occurs in networks of interconnected neurons. Our brain is made of billions of these neurons, each connected to many others. Here you see some schematic neurons, and uh, the main part then is the body of the neuron. And if you see um, those little um, hair-like uh, structures coming out of the body, those are the dendrites, and then the prolongations to the right uh, are the axons. Well, neurons communicate with each other at uh, what are called synapses. Right? So each neuron receives electrochemical inputs from other neurons. And if the sum of these electrical inputs is sufficiently powerful to activate the neuron, it transmits an electrochemical signal along the axon. So the neuron passes this signal to other neurons. And then these uh, other neurons may then fire or may refrain from firing depending on whether the connections are excitatory or inhibitory. So our entire brain is composed of these interconnected electrochemical transmitting neurons. Well, thus far, artificial neural networks haven't even come close to modeling the complexity of the brain, and uh, nor do they need to, to do what they are supposed to do. Okay, connectionist models are built in a series of assumptions, and there are two that are central. For instance, it is assumed that the functional units, the neurons, are relatively uniform in how they operate. Also, it's assumed that the patterns of connections among neurons are central to determining how the brain processes information. Well, now let's talk about connectionist architecture. That is, uh, what are the main parts of a connectionist network and uh, their main properties and their relations to other parts. The main, the central element, again, just like we have the neuron in, in nervous systems, um, are called the units. And again, uh, they're also called nodes or neurons because the role, again, is analogous to that of neurons. Of course, these neurons abstract away from many of the features of real biological cells, of the neural systems, but they are the smallest functional unit. And their central property is that they hold activation levels, which are basically numerical values, which can vary through time. The other important components are the connections among units, which are analogous to synapses and allow signals to travel across the different units comprising the network. Their central property is that they can be stronger or weaker, and so they are assigned a weight, which again is a number that can vary from one moment to the other. Just like in biological synapses, some of these connections are excitatory, in case they increase the activation of the receiving node, or they can be inhibitory, if they tend to reduce it. Then, as you can imagine, a network is built out of units, that is, neuron-like nodes, linked by connections. Let's take a closer look at the units. As we said before, the neuron units are the basic information processing elements. They basically receive input signals from other units, update their activation level based on the input signals, and send output signals to other units. These units are arranged in layers of which there can be two or more. In the simplest case, we only have two layers of nodes in input and output positions. By the way, you will sometimes hear about single layer perceptrons as a simple possible neural network. But in this case, we're talking about layers or, of connections. As in this case, we only have one layer of connections. Networks can have more layers sandwiched between the input and the output. These are called hidden layers. Again, in the simplest case, networks only have forward connections, such that the signal goes from the input layer to the output layer 
and not the other way around. And uh, this is in contrast with uh, recurrent networks, which have a, a flow of signals in both directions. Okay, let's take a look at how these units operate. As we said earlier, units have activation values. Um, this activation value is a number usually between 0 and 1. A unit, unless it is in the input layer, will typically receive its input from other units in the previous layer. Then, after some processing, it will deliver an output to the units it is itself connected to, unless it is in the output layer. Now, how do units arrive at their outputs? They do it on the basis of the activation levels of the units that fit into it, and also on the basis of the strength of the connection between those units and itself. So, to repeat, units compute their output on the basis of the input signals from other units. So, suppose that a unit U is fed by unit V. Now, U's response depends on two things. The first one is V's activation level, which we represent here by the number N. And the second is the strength of the connection between V and U. The strength of the connection is referred to as its weight and is represented by a low, lowercase w, usually with two subindices corresponding to the two participating units. A connection weight w is a number, a real number, usually between minus 1 and 1. And uh, the higher the absolute value of w, the stronger the connection. Moreover, uh, a negative value indicates an inhibitory connection, and a positive one, an excitatory connection. Okay, this is all for this video. See you on the next one. Bye.